Now, it is uh, World Humanitarian Day on Sunday, an event which pays tribute to international aid workers who risk their lives around the world. Events have already been taking place, including one here in London yesterday, which focused on the mental health needs of those who dedicate their lives to helping others. A study by the consultant psychologist Fiona Dunkley found that of the aid workers who asked for psychological consultations after their assignments, only 20% felt their organisation offered sufficient psychosocial support. Found that 30% of aid workers reported symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. The study also highlights that the risk of sexual violent crime to aid workers has increased by 25% over the past two years and that the risk of kidnapping and hostage taking increased by 33% over the past three years. Well, with me now is the global affairs analyst Michael uh, Bosacu, who's a former spokesman for both the Organisation for Security uh, and Operation in Europe and uh, UNICEF. Hello, we, we have met actually yes. in conflict zones in uh, Ukraine, for Correct. example. Uh, are you saying, or is this report saying, that charities and organisations are simply not doing enough for the people who are on the front line? Absolutely, they're not doing enough. Even big organisations like the ICRC, who have implemented things like hotlines and time off, uh, counsellors, um, people there say, you actually have to beg for time off. And you know, we have um, a, a situation in this industry, and don't forget that there are more conflicts happening, they're happening with more intensity, they're more deadly, but people tend to hop from disaster to disaster without any time off, and that creates added stress there. But, but can these organizations realistically employ people uh, and, and, and have a, the funds to employ enough people if people are gonna need all this time off at the end? I think so, and you know, it really, at the end of the day, it's up to the donors, for example, here in the UK, DFID, to press these organizations to provide these types of uh, counseling services, but also that time off, because the quality of interventions or projects really depends on the quality of the people working on the front lines. And just quickly, I mean, today we were reminded of a tragedy at Amnesty International. Two staff members from the UK committed suicide and they weren't even in the field. No, but, but, but we don't know quite what was behind that, do right. we? So, so you can't draw, you can't right. draw that, that link mm -hmm. necessarily here. I mean, you have traveled around a lot. You've been in, uh, in dangerous situations. Just tell me about the sort of stress that you and indeed sure. journalists feel in, in scenarios like this and how that manifested itself for you and your colleagues? Well, yes, the two careers are very similar, humanitarian aid work and journalism, and actually it's kind of awkward for me to talk about this personally because I am an advocate for this and a spokesperson. But yeah, I mean, my first uh, three months in Ukraine for the OSC, we had two kidnappings and the crash of MH17. And um, I guess for me as a spokesperson, it's a bit different because I talk, I let everything out, it doesn't fester inside, but yet it was very, very difficult. And the other thing that happened, uh, by the way, is that we often got attacked by Russian trolls. They would scrub our personal or social media accounts and then put it out to the world. And that was, that creates this added stress, so very difficult. Uh, and for people coming into the business now, I mean, it's a very different organization than it would have been 40 years ago, isn't it? When none of these things were really con con confronted. And then people seem to, to get through. I mean, there, there is a school of thought, isn't there, which is saying, actually, if you're going to become a, uh, an aid worker, that is your job. It sort of goes with the territory. Well, it, it does go with the territory. But honestly uh, speaking, I think there's very little screening going on. And remember, the industry has gone through its own Me Too movement and a few, quite a few bad apples there. But I think it has to be recognized that people, especially after a traumatic, traumatic event like an earthquake or a conflict zone like Eastern Ukraine, they're going to need time off, they're going to need counselling afterwards because it's a very, very, diffi very difficult industry. And just briefly, I mean, there will be some people, though, will there, who will just not be suited for this sort of work. You know, they will not be able to go back to work afterwards. And, and surely aid agencies and organisations need to take that into account as well. A absolutely. I said that yesterday on the panel, is that when there's a dramatic event, typically uh, professionals are taken away from the field, sent home, and then they're brought back and put it, either put in the field or in headquarters. And uh, again, without the proper time off and without the proper counselling, they're not going to cope well at all, even the hardcore professionals. OK, Michael Bosque, good to see you. Thank you very Pleasure. much uh, indeed. Uh, stay with us here on Impact. Still to come, uh, they are competitions that draw millions of spectators around the world. But are e-games really suited for a place in the Olympics?